Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. Don't forget, I have two other podcasts out there, From John to Justin, which releases every single Friday, and Canada's Great War, which releases every single Sunday. Both are available on all podcast platforms. If you like, you can email me at craig at CanadaEHX.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. Today I'm looking at the community of Fort St. John in British Columbia, and there's some really interesting history, and some history that goes back a very long ways. So, let's get right to it. The Indigenous For thousands of years, the area around Fort St. John was the traditional territory of the Deneza Indigenous. Archaeological evidence conducted in the area has found that there was an indigenous settlement in the area dating back at least 10,500 years. Artifacts have been found at Charlie Lake Cave, located south of Fort St. John, and in this cave, which is a single room, many artifacts have been found including a distinctive fluted spear of point, a variety of stone tools, and even homemade bread. The bread is considered to be the oldest found in North America. The cave shows the oldest evidence of ritual acts in Canada as well. One of the most unusual finds at the site, and something that has not been recovered from other sites of of comparable age, uh, were two bird burials. And in both cases, these were burials of ravens. Uh, The raven, of course, uh, throughout its range, has uh, important uh, spiritual connotations. It doesn't matter whether you're Uh, in Europe, uh, Asia, or North America, the raven is is seen as a very special bird, uh, often associated with hunting. And at Charlie Lake Cave, we had two ravens that were deliberately buried. Uh, One uh, dates to the very earliest time period, so close to 12,000 years ago, and the other one is perhaps a thousand years later. Uh, The slightly later raven is particularly interesting because it was not only deliberately buried, but it was also buried with an artifact, uh, which shows, I think, quite definitely that people were involved uh, either in the sacrifice of of this bird or possibly uh, they gathered up the remains of of a recently dead bird and and buried it carefully uh, in the cave site. it's extremely rare to find evidence for spiritual beliefs in sites of this age. There are, there are very, very few sites uh, in North America, for example, that have any indication of the belief systems of uh, some of the first people to live in the Americas. Uh, we have a painted bison skull, for example, uh, from a site in the Southern Plains. Uh, we have a, a very small number of human burials, and, and that's really about the only evidence we have so far for uh, spirituality. And I think that's mainly because most of the sites that have been excavated are are kill sites, places where early hunters uh, killed animals such as mammoth and bison. And those tend not to be the sorts of sites where spiritual activity uh, uh, occurs or or is preserved in the archaeological record. Charlie Lake Cave isn't a kill site. It's uh, probably a a campsite, a place where people stopped for a few days as as part of their annual uh, round of activities. Uh, We can guess that there were men, women, and children there, uh, and this is the kind of place where uh, spiritual activity might occur. Uh, In addition, the presence of the cave itself is is interesting, uh, and and caves are often associated with spiritual beliefs. So we think there may be a relationship here between uh, these rather carefully buried ravens uh, and the presence of the cave, which could perhaps have been uh, symbolic of an entrance into the underworld or another world, Uh, Again, a fairly common belief in in many parts of the world uh, concerning caves. Roughly 100 kilometers north of Fort St. John, there's also Pink Mountain Archaeological Site. It shows that people were not only moving through, but settling as early as 3,000 years ago. 
Today, Fort St. John sits on Treaty 8 land which was negotiated in 1899 after Klondikers began to move through the area of the Beaver people, which the indigenous had previously tried to refuse entry to. The Seven Forts The first European to move through the area was likely Sir Alexander Mackenzie, who came through in 1793 during his exploration of the Arctic region in the hopes of finding a path to the Pacific. One year after he passed through, the first of seven forts was built in the area. That fort was called Rocky Mountain House, which should not be confused with the fort to the south in Alberta, also named that. With the establishment of this fort, the first European settlement on the mainland of British Columbia, Fort St. John, can lay claim to being the oldest European established settlement in the province. This fort would close in 1805. One year later, Fort d'Epinay was built by the Northwest Company. It would be renamed as Fort St. John in 1821 following the merger of the Northwest Company and Hudson's Bay Company following the Pemmican War. I did an episode on that just a while ago, please check it out. The four would only operate for two more years after that when it closed in 1823. At the same time, Fort de Benet was established a small trading post called the Revelon Frere was built, consisting of just a two-story cabin, and it would soon shut down. In the 1860s, Fort St. John was built on the south side of the community and it would operate until 1872. When that fort closed, a new Fort St. John was built on the north side of the river, directly across from the previous fort. That fort would have some of the most success of all the previous forts, lasting until 1925 when it closed due to a new wagon trail that was built to Fort Nelson. The trading post, Revelon Frere, would return in 1910, but again it did not last long and was soon closed. The last of the forts, Fort St. John, built in 1925 on Fish Creek on the northwest of the community, was built to take advantage of the new wagon trail that had closed down the previous fort. The fort would be the most successful operating until 1975. And it would be kind of incorrect to call this a fort in the general sense, as it was more of a tiny town that would become a ghost town by the 1970s, as the much larger Fort St. John, the other town, rose in prominence in the area. The Founding of the Community in 1913, the first settlers started to take up homesteads in the area around Fort St. John, located in what was called the Peace River Block. This block of land was 3.5 million acres that had been given to the federal government by British Columbia in 1883. The initial influx of residents was slow at first, but in the 1920s another wave of new settlers arrived when the Second Homestead Act allowed prairie farmers to settle in the Peace District after drought had destroyed their farms elsewhere. In 1928, C.M. Finch moved his general store to land, where he also built a government building that housed the land, telegraph, and post office. He then donated five acres of land to the Roman Catholic Church and additional land for a hospital, sparking the beginning of what would be Fort St. John. One of the biggest changes to come to Fort St. John, which helped it grow immensely, was the construction of the Alaska Highway. The road, which was built by the U.S. Army and the Canadian government, was built over the course of only nine months from March to September of 1942. I did an entire episode on this construction just a few weeks ago. I encourage you to check it out on the podcast feed or go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. With the building of the road, modern transportation came to Fort St. John, but it came at a great cost, something I'll get to in another section. In 1951, the community would enter a new era when Fort St. John No. 1 hit gas at a depth of 1,524 meters. In 1952, a second well was dug and hit gas at 4,418 meters. That well is still operating to this day. Due to the abundant oil and gas in the area, the Hart Highway was built that connected Fort St. John with the rest of the province. Today, Fort St. John is one of the largest communities in British Columbia and is home to over 20,000 people. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I've spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, 
and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet, and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. The Charles Badeau Expedition In 1934, a new visitor came through the area that provided the residents of Fort St. John with something new and unique to witness. Charles Badeau was a French-American millionaire who made a fortune implementing the work measurement aspect of scientific management. He was also a big game hunter and explorer, and that would bring him to the Fort St. John area. The Badeau Canadian Subarctic Expedition was an attempt by Badeau to cross the wilderness of northern Alberta and British Columbia while making a film that showed his half-track vehicles, essentially making the expedition a publicity stunt for the vehicles. Leaving with more than 100 people, including his wife, his mistress, and Floyd Crosby, an Academy Award-winning director who would go on to make High Noon, dozens of cowboys and a large film crew, The expedition left Edmonton on July 6, 1934, with the goal of traveling 2,400 kilometers to Telegraph Creek in British Columbia. After being sent off in a ceremony from Edmonton involving the Lieutenant Governor of Alberta, the group made Grand Prairie on July 12th and Fort St. John on July 17th. They would remain in the community until July 22nd, purchasing supplies, hiring more cowboys, repairing their vehicles, and attending several banquets. At the same time, Badeau decided that the expedition needed to be more newsworthy, so he fired his radio operator in Fort St. John and announced his expedition would continue on without a radio. By October 17th, the group had made Hudson Hope and decided to turn back and end the expedition. The Charlie Lake Sinking Nearby Charlie Lake would see the single worst loss of life during the construction of the Alaska Highway. It was on May 14, 1942 at 8 a.m. when a pontoon boat was traveling across the lake with 17 men, along with a great deal of equipment including a bulldozer, radio command car, and drums of oil. The water was choppy with one-foot waves, and by 11.15 a.m., The boat was two-thirds of the way across the lake when the men noticed a plug had come out of the gas line on one of the motors and gasoline was draining out. As the boat began to turn, two waves hit it, tipping the pontoon and pushing it under the waves. The entire sequence happened in only two minutes. Gustav Albin Hedden, a trapper, was watching the pontoon go across the lake through the morning. He then returned to his stove to check on his breakfast and when he looked back, he saw the pontoon was gone and men were swimming in the water around where he had last seen it. He then launched a 14-foot rowboat and reached the men in 15 minutes. There, he found nine men still alive, but due to the fact they were in heavy winter clothing and boots, he had difficulty rescuing them, and also several could not swim. He rescued two, then came back for two more, and upon his last trip out, he was only able to find one man. In all... 12 were killed in the accident. The Fort St. John North Peace Museum If you'd like to see the history of Fort St. John over the course of the centuries, then the Fort St. John North Peace Museum is the perfect place to spend a day. While there, you can learn about the history of the area, including exploring a teepee, trapper's cabin, blacksmith shop, schoolhouse, dentist's office, newspaper office, an Alaska highway exhibit, 
and a British Columbia police barracks and jail. You can also touch a beaver pelt, try on a sugar sack apron, and even compare your feet to those of the dinosaurs. You can also see museum exhibits at the North Peace Regional Airport and the Fort St. John Hospital. And the museum also features wildlife mounts including a mule deer and a polar bear. Wendy Arlene Clay one of the most notable individuals to come out of Fort St. John is Wendy Arlene Clay, who was born in the community on September 27, 1942. In 1965, Clay would join the military as a medical student, earning her medical degree two years later. That same year, she was posted at CFB Trenton in Ontario as a general duty medical officer and became the first woman to receive training as a Canadian Forces flight surgeon. In 1970, she would be promoted to major and transferred to CFB Moose Jaw. While there, she underwent basic flight training in 1972, and in 1973, she transferred to the training command in Winnipeg. In 1974, she became the first woman in the Canadian Air Force to receive her wings. In 1977, she was promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and joined the Canadian Forces Institute of Environmental Medicine in Toronto, as the Director of Medical Assessment and Training Division. Subsequently promoted to Colonel after a six-month tour of duty with the Canadian United Nations contingent in Egypt, she became a command surgeon at the Air Command Headquarters in Winnipeg. In 1989, she was promoted to Brigadier General, and she served as the Commandant of the National Defence Medical Centre, holding that appointment until 1992. In 1994, after a promotion to Major General, she was appointed Surgeon General, the first woman in the Canadian Armed Forces to have that rank and appointment, and she remained in that post until her retirement in 1998. She currently lives in Victoria, British Columbia. Other Notable Residents There are several people who lived in Fort St. John with some pretty amazing stories. Dr. Garnet Kearney was a doctor who was educated at McGill University and he arrived in Fort St. John in 1935, replacing Dr. Brown, the first doctor in Fort St. John. As an early advocate for Medicare, he did not charge for his services if a patient could not afford them. In 1939, 21-year-old Gordon Stock in Watson Lake, 625 kilometers away, was suffering from delirium and needed brain surgery. Jack Baker, the employer of the man, radioed Kearney for help. Kearney diagnosed Stock as having a cyst on his brain. He then stated that Baker had to operate to relieve pressure or Stock would die. Using the radio, Kearney instructed Baker what to do, with the surgery proving to be a success and Stock making a full recovery. Dr. Kearney Jr. Secondary School in Fort St. John is named for him. Beli Yahe was born around 1874, but it can't be confirmed as no records were kept at the time. By the time she died on July 16, 1976, she was heralded by CBC as the oldest woman in Canada when she reached the ripe old age of 116. The 1936 Fur Theft one event that made national headlines was the robbery of 19 bales of fur from Fort Nelson, amounting to $32,000 on July 12, 1936. Nels Natland, Oliver McMartin, and Bob Gillard were bound with rope and put into the basement. The trap door was closed and flour barrels were pulled over. The men would remain in the basement for two hours until they were finally able to free themselves. In order to catch the men who robbed the Hudson's Bay Company trading post, the British Columbia and Alberta Provincial Police searched through the area from Fort Nelson to Fort St. John, including the use of an airplane. Constable H. Bailey of Fort St. John was supposed to leave on patrol for Dead Man's Lake, but this was cancelled until arrests were made in the matter. Constable J. S. Clark of Fort Nelson would capture the men near Fort St. John on August 12, 1936, ending a saga that gripped the area for an entire month. Magistrate J.W. Abbott of Fort St. John would oversee the case in the trial of Bert Sheffield and Henry Corvisay, and both men were released on $10,000 bail, which would amount to $188,000 today. 
both men would be found not guilty of possession of stolen furs. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Fort St. John. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can reach me through email at craig at canadaehx.com. You can also visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.com. And don't forget you can support the podcast through Patreon. There are multiple tiers to choose from, all with great benefits. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month, just like all of these wonderful patrons have, and I apologize if I mispronounce any names. Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Randall McCallum, Diane Wade, Lorianne Kirby, Gary Dolovich, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. If you want, you can find me on Facebook. Just go to facebook.com slash CanadianHistoryX. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And you can find me on Instagram. Just go to Bairdo37. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.